Hey, it's Modern at Rotech, and today we have a bit of an unusual episode because we will look at front-end development with Rust. Uh, of course, for that we will use WebAssembly and we will look specifically at a framework called U. I really hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. So, what is U? Quoting the uh, official website, it's a framework for creating reliable and efficient web applications. For people who are already familiar with front-end, it has two primary ways to program it. It's either React-style hooks or it's the Elm architecture. And don't worry if you don't know those words yet, we will look briefly at what each of those means and how it looks in practice. U has a lot of features bundled into it. For example, it has components, it has GSX like HTML syntax, it has server-side rendering, it has web workers, routers, suspense, etc., etc. This video will mostly focus on two primary things. One thing is just general introduction into how U works, what kind of programming model it has, and how you can use it. And second part is going through my experience, what went good, what went bad, and what went completely not so good. So what is the Elm architecture? Elm architecture is a way to write front-end applications with explicit state model. Essentially, your whole application state is represented as a large struct, and you can store everything in this struct, uh, user input, state of the buttons, if some model dialog opened, or something like that. This struct is initialized and then sent to a view function. View function takes it and produces virtual DOM that is then compiled to produce a real DOM that you can see in your browser. Virtual DOM is just a data structure that is used internally by the framework to optimize manipulations with DOM, so you don't need to redraw the whole application on every update, essentially. What happens when user, for example, enters something into an input field or presses on a button? Well, you use normal JavaScript-like callbacks. But those callbacks, instead of trying to manipulate DOM directly, they send messages. And those messages, together with the current state that you have, is sent to a so-called update function. Update function then recomputes the state, depending on what it is there right now, and depending on the message that you sent. If the state was updated, view function creates a new virtual DOM, then typically a different process is used to figure out how to update the real DOM, and the user sees the updated interface. Let's look how that looks in U. In this case, we will start with the struct. Then we need to provide those view and update functions, at least to make an application. U provides a trait called component that you can then implement for your model struct. In this trait, you can override the view and update functions. View function takes an immutable reference to model and it takes a context. And context essentially allows you to send messages to yourself. View function produces HTML, which is the type that is this um, virtual DOM we were talking about. You can see that to produce HTML, we use HTML micro, and inside we can write pretty much normal HTML, but we can also embed some Rust code. For example, here you can see that we define a button, and inside that button we can define all the typical attributes like class, etc., but we also define a callback on click. In this case, we use our context to dispatch message to ourselves, which just in this case says that the button was clicked. Next up is the update function. Instead of taking an immutable reference to model, it takes immutable reference to model, so you can directly update it. It also takes context, so you can, for example, emit additional messages to yourself if you want to, and it also takes the message that was received. It returns a Boolean, in case a re-render is needed, you should return true, and in most cases you will return true. But in case, for example, you just received a message to which you don't need to do any visual changes, you can return false, and then re-render will not be triggered. Now, inside this function, what you would typically do, you will match on the message, and message will typically be an, a Rust enum. For example, here we can see that we receive some message called cell change, so we can take some cell value and we can reassign it and then we can re-render. This is in principle sufficient to write pretty much any front-end application you might want to write. However, you provide another syntax that might be more familiar for React web developers, specifically called hooks or functional components. 
In this case, instead of creating a struct and implementing a component chain for it, what you do, you just write a normal function, you decorate it with function component attribute, your function returns HTML. As usual, it can also optionally accept props. For example, you can set them in parent components if you want to. And then inside that function, you can use a special magic, uh, which is, uh, for example, in this case, the hooks that we are using is called use state, which essentially allows you to use some state and modify it and re-render the component whenever it changes. In this case, we are just doing a simple counter. We initialized our state to be zero, and then we create a callback on click. In this case, we need to clone our counter variable, and then we create this specific callback types that you use internally. We just set counter to be its value plus one. And in the end, we again use HTML macro. In this case, you can see that we pass this on click callback to button. And by the way, if the callback has the same name as uh, JavaScript callback name, you can use this shorthand syntax. We just put curly braces around it. We also displace the current value to reference in our counter reference. Now to make the following examples a bit more involved, we will look at the demo I built, and then we will return and look at good, bad, and ugly parts with some code examples as well. So it looks like a normal spreadsheet. It has rows and columns, you can scroll through them, and of course you can also enter some values and you can use enter to confirm them. Then, for example, uh, you can do something like that. You can also enter just a normal string. And here we can also enter a formula, so we can reference other cells. Let's just do it like that. I didn't implement the range um, selection or anything like that, but you can see that the value was updated, and we can also update stuff through this little thing, by the way. You can see that everything is dynamically recomputed. You can also copy the state of the table. Let's reload it and let's paste it. You can see that we got just a normal JSON when we clicked on this copy all button. And uh, when we paste it, we got our, our table as it was. And now back to you. So the good parts. And before I even get into that, I wanted to say that I really enjoyed working with the framework. It kind of escalated my um, demo a little bit because I only wanted to implement a couple of simple functions, but then it was so much fun to work with it. I just kind of continued to do stuff until I pretty much forcibly stopped myself. But that being said, let's look at specific objective things that are good about uh, this approach. And the first one, of course, is that Rust is fast, WebAssembly is fast. So you can write very fast applications with that. And I didn't even do all the suggested performance uh, optimizations. For example, official documentation suggests using attribute value type instead of string to avoid some cloning. But I didn't feel that I need to do it because everything was already very fast. But anyhow, if you write a production application, you probably should do that. Um, WebAssembly is fast. It's about half of the speed of bare metal performance that you can achieve, but you still need to be aware of data copying costs. WebAssembly has its own memory space. It's separate from the space that the rest of JavaScript application would use. So if you have a WebAssembly screen or specific function that is part of a large application, you need to be aware that copying data back and forth can be expensive. Let's look how this demo can handle slightly larger spreadsheet. In this case, we will fill all the rows and all the columns. We have 50 rows. We have columns uh, from A to Z, essentially. So 24, 26, don't remember. Anyhow, um, I wrote a little Python script that allows you to generate a table that always does the same thing. Essentially, you have um, numbers from 1 to 50 in the first column, and then the second column refers to those numbers and multiplies them by 1.25. And the next column after that, the C column, it refers to previous column, in this case B, and does the same operation. So we can just copy this huge JSON file, and then we can just paste it. And when we paste it, you can see that the interface is extremely snappy. And of course, whenever you update something, for example, let's do it like that, you can see that the whole row updates immediately. Same if you go here and, for example, start to uh, change something. 
you can see as I type in everything is updating there is literally no delay and this table is pretty big. The next part that I really loved is the programming model. By providing both the Elm architecture and React style hooks essentially provides you best of both worlds kinda. I would say that a rule of thumb is that you should go for Elm architecture also called struct components whenever you work on a whole application state management or very complex pages. And you probably should use hooks for smaller components, especially something visual, like for example, you have buttons and you just need to pass on a click callback to them. You can easily do that. It will be less code. It will be easier to maintain. Now, the main pros of the Elm architecture is that state and all changes to the state are explicit. So you can easily implement features like undo and redo, or for example, state export and import what you saw in the demo whenever we take the whole JSON from the table and when we paste it back. That was very easy to do, and we will look at this code in a second. Another thing that is cool about the ARM architecture is that it explicitly models a state machine. Essentially, any UI you can model as a state machine. You have some application state, User does some action, application state changes somehow according to this action. And in case of the ARM architecture, it's essentially exactly what you're doing. You have this specific state, you have specific messages, you specifically write what will happen in state on every message. There are also some cons. First of all, of course, it can be pretty verbose because you will need to write uh, code for each message. You will need to model every little piece of state explicitly. And specifically in case of you, struct components are not recommended whenever you want to do server-side rendering. Now, let's look at how I implemented the table import. So in this case, uh, we have our struct call table that is the state of our whole application, essentially. And you can see that we have things that are specific UI stuff, like focus cell, which cell is input, if any. And we have stuff that is logical state of application, like the state of all of our inputs. It's a hash map from cell ID to a string. We also have the parsed cells in expressions, and we have computed and values that should be shown to user in yet another hash map. We also have an enum for messages. Um, again, I'm not showing all of them, but you can see that we have messages that are just Notification of action, like copy all messages that contain some um, information, for example, cell changed message has cell ID and new value of that cell, and we have many, many more. The main ones that we will be looking at here is based all content that has a serialized table as a string. How do we serialize table as a string? Well, it's quite simple. We create a new struct called serialize table, and we define serialize and deserialize on that, and those traits, of course, come from Serda, and we can call Serda JSON, um, convert this into serializable table. If the conversion is successful, we can then set our inputs on the table, which is state of the app, to be equal to the inputs we got in this serializable table instance. And then we can reparse everything, and then we can reevaluate everything. And you can see that it's also very convenient in you to add functions like reval where I'm doing something with state, some more complex operation that is maybe not related to um, any specific action, you can just define it as a method on this specific struct. And finally, let's look how uh, our table component will look like. Um, of course, we have, uh, we set our message type to be a message. We have view and update functions. And in case of view function, we essentially just use a model component that I define that is a functional component. Both struct and function components work together. Um, and in this case, I have on paste callback that will send me a paste all content message with the CLIs table. And in case of update, when we receive this message paste all content, we just call the function I was just showing cells from string, passing this CLIs table into that and we're rendering our app because we returned true. Now, if we looked at the Elm architecture, the question is, when do you want to use hooks? And hooks have following pros and cons. The main pro of using hooks is, of course, um, they are simpler, they are more concise. They also, in case of you, work better with server-side rendering. Some cons are that hooks require you to essentially scatter state a bit. You don't have this nice 
one single struct in which the whole app state encapsulated in anymore. You have a bunch of local variables, essentially. So implementing some features can become harder. Of course, nothing prevents you from putting your whole application state inside a use state hook, but that's not how they are usually used. Another thing that is specific to hooks is that there are specific rules you must follow when using them. You should check use documentation about rules of hooks. They are very similar to the rules of hooks um, in React. So for example, you need to define them in the beginning of your function and stuff like that. It's not really problematic to follow those rules, but they can be somewhat unintuitive at first. So let's look at a large example of using hooks. Here we will look at this paste model components that I was using just before in our import example. Function component itself is just a function with function component attribute and accepting a reference to the props and returning HTML, which is our VDOM. If you look at the body of this function, I shortened it a bit. I only wanted to highlight what happens when you use the hook itself. So in this case, we use a hook called useState, and by the way, there are many others. You can check the documentation as well to see the whole list, and you can define your own as well. In this case, we just define our state to be an empty string, and then we create a callback on input. So what will happen when the user inputs something into the field you saw on the paste all model? Well, we need to clone the value thingy, because otherwise it will be moved into closure and we won't be able to use it anymore. Then we create the callback data structure. And here you can see in the body of that callback the first time us interacting with JavaScript with the browser API. So in this case, we look at the input event, we take the target of this event, the HTML elements that received the event. We, in this case, go a bit YOLO unwrapping it, and then we convert it to HTML text area element and we unwrap it as well. Then we take the value of this input and we call set function on value and set our value to be this input's value essentially. In the end of the function, you can see how all of that is wired together. We use HTML macro again, we create a model, and yes, model is yet another function component where I abstracted a bunch of logic for closing uh, models, for making background blur and stuff like that. This is a really cool feature about doing those components is that you can kind of reuse them, you can build on top of them. It's all very composable with each other. Um, you can see that here, for example, I set visibility of model to be uh, equal to the value passed in props. So parent of the component defines if it's visible. And inside the main thing is text area where I can use the value uh, reference that we created using hook that is the value that will be displayed uh, in the text area. And we also pass on input callback to handle on input events. You can also notice that I set uh, Tailwind classes here, and I wrote a blog post about how to integrate Tailwind with you, and I will add the link uh, in the description for the video. Now, that example aside, we have another obvious um, plus of using you, it's um, the power of Rust's type system. This strong type system combined with the Elm architecture or hooks, which rely essentially on very carefully managed state, allows you to build very resilient UIs. Of course, you also have explicit error handling. So a lot of APIs that when you use them from JavaScript will suddenly throw an error at you and you will not even suspect that they can. In case of Rust, they typically will be modeled as something that returns results. So you will know that you need to handle the error case. Finally, using you, you have seamless access to the most of Rust ecosystem, which means that you can use all the libraries you already know on the front end, and you can use the same libraries on the back end. In this demo, for example, I used lazy static, I used regex, I used certain set the JSON. That being said, there was some parts that are not ideal. And before I go into this part, I wanted to say that a lot of this is not specific to you. It's more about WebAssembly itself and limitations that come with WebAssembly. And it's also about Rust and some specific considerations whenever you use Rust, right? And the first one is, of course, the slow compile times. Now, 
Rust compile times became way, way better over the years, and normally it's no longer a big problem. But in case of you, they are a bit of a problem, and this is specifically because of a front-end developer experience thing. Whenever you work on front-end, you typically will try to have a hot reload, and if your compilation is slow, it means your hot reload is slow. For me, it typically is about five seconds. I also have added delay because of Tailwind, so Tailwind takes like half a second to recreate the style, and then uh, Rust takes a couple of seconds to compile, and Trunk, the bundle tools that you use, it does a bunch of stuff as well. So kind of you get this four or five seconds delay whenever you do some change. If you're writing some more complex logic, it's not a problem. If you're iterating on styles, it can be a problem. It's definitely not a showstopper, but it is something that is a bit worse, especially if you compare to something like Svelte or React, where you will typically have instant reloads. Another issue that is also very specific to WebAssembly is bundle size. So this demo is about 1.2 megabytes, and it's, um, most of it is the WebAssembly file itself. Then there is a bit of JavaScript on top, and then there is CSS. You can optimize bundle size, and I'm using um, opt level S, which essentially makes the bundle smaller. There is also that um, opt level, which will make it even smaller, but it will be a bit slower. In my case, it just didn't produce any additional saving, um, so I decided to stick with S. You, as far as I understand, it also uses Wasm optimizer automatically. So you kind of already, by default, get pretty decent bundle sizes, but it's still more than a megabyte for a pretty small demo. Another thing that, in this case, this is specific to you, is that there is no support for separate template files. So if you write a larger component, it can be quite painful because you essentially have this huge scene inside your Rust code, and you have a bunch of Rusts in there. And sometimes you just have a lot of layouts that doesn't require any logic that you would like to extract into a, compo into a separate HTML file. Sadly, this is not possible. It's definitely not a big deal, just a little inconvenience. Finally, and this is again, this is problem with Rust, not with you specifically. Debug mode Rust is extremely, extremely painfully slow. So when I tried first to do this demo, using debug mode compilation, it was essentially not workable. You would press the button and then you will wait. So um, the moment I switched to release mode, it was not a problem anymore. You saw the thing flies, but in principle, it can affect compile times, of course. And now finally, the funniest and saddest part, the ugly stuff that definitely can be a showstopper for you in case you want to use it for some production application. First thing is the amount of FFI you need to do. Uh, in this case, FFI, of course, means foreign function interface. So anytime you want to interact with a JavaScript API, apart from the fact that you need to do FFI, right, compared to a JavaScript framework where you just call a function, you also need to consider the state of Rust um, ecosystem for WebAssembly. You will need to essentially use several pre-version 1 libraries to do pretty much anything. In this example, I used WebSys, which provides bindings to the um, web APIs, to browser APIs, to stuff like document, window, etc. It uses internally a thing called Wasm bind again, which you can use to essentially call any JavaScript code from uh, WebAssembly. And since some of those APIs use promises in JavaScript, it means that we also need to convert them to Rust futures and run those futures. And for that, you need to use Wasm bind again futures library. Let's just say you will have some fun going between different um, APIs of those libraries. Since most of this code is also auto-generated, there are usually no examples. So you kind of cross your fingers and hope that it will work and that it does what you expect it to do. You kind of need to go to, um, you also need to go to MDN website often to see the actual documentation for the browser API, then figure out how it relates to the bindings that you have, and then essentially hope that type system will carry you. And the resulting code can look pretty ugly 
and some features will require you to use custom compiler flags, something that I never did before. So it was also a bit of a fun figuring out how to set up my editor, how to set up trunk, this bundler tools that doesn't have any documentation about how to do it. I figured it out. And in case you're going through the same pain, check out the readme file in the repo for this demo example, because I wrote down how to configure all of that stuff. Here's an example of interacting with the browser API when we try to copy our state of the table. So we convert the table to string and we just need to copy the string to clipboard. For that, we need to go into a sync rust essentially. So you can see that we create a sync closure. We also use this spawn local function that is provided by the VAS bind again futures library to run it essentially. And then we use websys to get window. We go YOLO, we unwrap the window. We take navigator object, and then we can finally take clipboard. And if we have access to clipboard, we create JS future from JS promise that we receive whenever we call write text function on clipboard with our, with reference to our string, then we need to await. And if everything's good, well, we, done, we are done. If something goes wrong, we log to console. And logging to console also looks very funnily, as you can see. Rust doesn't have variadic functions, and JavaScript does. So a lot of functions would have a number of arguments written after them. In this case, we just use log1, and we create a JS value from a Rust string. So again, a lot of stuff is happening here. It's not completely awful, but it's definitely way more code and way more complexity than just doing this stuff in JavaScript. Another thing that really sucks about uh, building an interface with you is that you essentially stuck with manual error handling. You might have noticed that I didn't use the question mark syntax in any of that code. And the reason for that is that if you accidentally return result from any of your functions and then you panic, for example, unwrapping this result, you're screwed. Your interface will not just write some error to console, it will like completely stop working. You will need to actually reload the tab to get it working again. And of course you will lose all your state. If you panic, you screwed. You don't need to panic, but uh, since most new functions also don't return results, you need to manually handle every single error or you need to create helper functions that return result and then these results need to be handled uh, when you call this from you. And now the biggest issue. There is essentially no sane way to debug this, and there is no sane way to test it. So debugging is a problem with WebAssembly in general again. It's not something specific to you, it's just because it sucks in WebAssembly, it sucks it when you use it with web, when you build WebAssembly applications with you as well. I Reds, there are some projects and some approaches you can use nowadays, but I mostly did uh, this log one function call with some string um, when I was working on this example. If you know a better way to do it, please tell it in the comments, um, but I didn't find anything easy to use. There are plans to add testing capabilities to you, but those are still plans, so there is nothing yet. Uh, essentially, you cannot easily test the apps uh, in you, which brings us to the final point. Shall you use it? And of course, when I say, shall I use it? I mean, shall I use it for prod? Because um, obviously, if you want to build a funny demo, none of that matters. But if you decide to use it in production applications, I would say there are several things that you need to consider. Essentially, it's kind of like if and only if all the following conditions apply situation. What are the conditions? Well, uh, essentially, it should be a performance critical component. Otherwise, you will just make your life harder without much reason for that. This specific part that you use U4 shouldn't be heavily dependent on calling JS APIs or, God forbid, external JavaScript libraries, because then you will need to write bindings for them yourself, and that will not be pleasant at all. Uh, you also can live with slow development velocity compared to something like React, Svelte, or Phoenix Live View. Finally, you should be fine with just doing end-to-end -end testing with something like Playwright or Cypress. If this is sufficient for your application, for this specific part of it at least, then it's all right. So, I hope it was interesting to watch, and of course, as usual, 
don't forget to leave like and subscribe. And also I recently set up a GitHub sponsors profile. So if you would like to support me doing more videos, you can find the link below and I will be extremely grateful. Thank you so much for watching.